The Zalian queen sat upon the larval bed while she absorbed the great knowing of her scouts. She had no eyes, for her eyes were her swarm. She had no legs, there was no need to move. She felt through the senses of her population. Most of it was just a dull, white noise, but with her personal attention focused on the signals that came through with the limited, autonomous judgment of importance from her collective population's experience. A new resource would generate excitement. An unexpected phenomenon generated curiosity, all filtering back to her to create a hierarchy of importance which she was constantly sorting through. When the Pankin Alliance was being annihilated, the sense of importance and danger that shot through the swarm observers drew her full attention. Her scout ship crews skirted the edges of the conflict, like opportunistic scavengers watching the war apes annihilate the once significant border empire. Curiosity was the predominant impulse when the danger passed, and the Zalian observers continued to hover near fallen Pankin worlds. The war apes ignored her observers until their populations occupied a world, after which her scout ships were politely but firmly warned that the area was now Terran Ascendant space and they should leave. The Zalian queen complied each time, but they continued to watch, and she continued to ask questions of the Keelan Confederation, and to have her semi autonomite drones ask questions of merchants and travelers who passed through war ape space. The media of the war apes was of little value to her, and her swarm had very little concept of entertainment. However, the impressions of the neighbor species had considerable value, so she took it very seriously when the Goslians and Kalanian patrol ships began to appear in Terran space and mix with Terran fleets. Strange, so strange, and also unacceptable. Unacceptable because these oversized patrols went from six jumps to three jumps from her species' claimed space, in part because her species had taken another system, but also because the Terrans settled two more themselves. She activated her communication station and reached the Terran colonial governor for the sector bordering her own. The war ape was dressed in his usual blue. His was not the only species that wore clothing, but seeing through the eyes of her aid drone, it was nevertheless still confounding to the Zalian queen. Majesty, he said and inclined his head. To what do I owe the pleasure? I have seen that you took another system. There were four worlds there. We had our eyes on that one. She said to him, her mandibles clicked rapidly when she spoke, unable to contain her annoyance. Perhaps you did, but we have our ships on it, he said. You will take no more systems that bring you close to Zalian space. She gave the brusque command, and the human stood in silence. With respect, Majesty, all worlds formerly under the dominion of the Pankin are fair for us to seize, including those with a surviving population of Pankians. You have no claim on those systems we do, he pointed out. You will take no more systems which bring you closer to Zalian space, she commanded again. I will take no orders from anyone but our presider. His lips pursed as he spoke, and his eyes hardened on the drone whose chitinous, sleek, dark body shook with anger. If you would like a temporary neutral zone between us where neither of us lands ships in those systems until such time as an official treaty can be negotiated between our governments, I have it in my power to grant a six-month stay of settlement. Yes, that will be acceptable. The Zalian queen replied, You will land no ships in the border systems. And neither will you. He replied pointedly, No. She answered, Tell your presider to arrange a meeting at a neutral location. We will talk of safe borders. I will. The governor of the region agreed and sent his recording to the Terran government. And the grand presider in turn reached out to the Gielan Confederation allies to act as intermediaries. Four months later, the Zalian colony ships touched down on the last few border systems, and the Pankin survivors were hunted to extinction, turned into biomatter. The transmission played to the Keelan Confederation Hall and all of their delegates. There is no further need for a conference. The matter has been resolved to our satisfaction. The entirety of the council erupted. Noise engulfed the Great Hall as the transmissions and in-person delegates alike condemned the occupation. An outrageous act of aggression in violation of faithful terms. 
the Keelan ambassador pronounced, a sentiment echoed by the rest. Yet the human grand presider was silent. As the biggest losers in the affair, expectant looks fell to the presider, allowing him a moment to erupt in outrage of his own. Yet he said nothing. He folded his arms in front of his broad chest and said in a voice like stone, We have a saying on earth. When people tell you who they are, believe them. The Zalians have told us who they are. Killing the Pankin there was unnecessary. They had regressed technologically to the point of barely industrial levels, or in some cases even further. Returning them to their home worlds would have been easy. And yet the Zalians chose to exterminate them for no other reason than that the Pankin were there. I feel nothing for the Pankin, but such a pointless act without even a war? He shook his head. No, this tells us what I need to know about the xenophobic Zalians and their respect for non-Zalian life. More than that, their queen lied, pretended a belief in peace, and then occupied what we would have been willing to share, all but daring us to make war. They have shown their true face to us, and we will remember. It was an unexpectedly mild response from the Terran presider, enough so that it left the assembly quite uncertain. Over the next year, however, they began to see what the presider's response entailed. Recombinated clones to increase genetic diversity, and hundreds of thousands of couples were relocated to the border worlds. Similarly, small numbers of other races were invited to settle among the Terran populations, and the starbases began to expand. Four successive Confederation bills were passed that resulted in supermassive space stations, repair and construction bays, and massive industrial investment was encouraged or provided from both Earth and closely allied worlds. The Terrans even began encouraging subject allies to relocate their poor or orphaned to the colonies, further boosting the employment and industry. The fleets also grew. Zalians ate the pankin. What would they do to us? The question kept the fleet slowly growing, and it was not lost on the Zalian queen. We wish to negotiate terms of trade and free passage to reach other worlds. She sent that transmission to many races and found herself blockaded. High Lord Avon looked at the proposal which sat on his desk. Humans would provide material in the event of any invasion by the massives. And if there were a three-system deep push entailing occupation or a two-system deep push by annihilation, human fleets would render aid, as long as no travel or trade was conducted with Zalians, and any Zalian-initiated conflict began. One of these reached every border region around Zalian space, didn't it? Or something like it? The old professor asked the High Lord. The way his bobbed his whole body spoke of his excitement. I assume so. The Zalians are quite bottled up, and they are feeling the strain. But it seems that the humans have proven adept at forming friendships with non-hostile neighbors. Their diplomatic acumen is impressive. There's only one uninhabited system within one uninhibited jump of Zalian space now, and the humans put a science station there. That is always a precursor to colonization. Do you think the queen will take the bait? The professor asked. She is used to getting her way, and she managed to take from the Terran ascendancy once before. She probably knows the war apes are behind her difficulty expanding. I'd say she'll see this as a dare, and because she was successful before, she will dare again. I think the presider knows it, High Lord Avon pointed out. I'm not an expert on the Zalians, but they can't be that stupid, the professor insisted. To that, Avon answered only with silence and bristled feathers before he signed the formal agreement. Grand Presider Maxwell listened while the Zalian Queen spoke. We will take the place you do not live. We have a space station there. We are in the process of colonizing it, he pointed out. Your station can go, she replied with imperious confidence. Those are not mobile, it cannot, he replied. We will pay for it, she offered. We aren't selling, and we have people working on the surface now, he responded. We will remove your biomatter, the Zalian queen pushed. We do not want them removed. That world is ours, he replied with no change of expression. The Zalian queen could not frown, but the long, broad mandibles that were nearly the size of the human's torso clicked back and forth with agitation. Our worlds are too few to hold us. We need space to grow. 
the Zalian queen made the point. Our galaxy needs peace. Our peace needs trust. You showed we could not trust you. That is why your ships are not welcome. Nobody trusts that you won't occupy a world and turn its population into biomatter for your nests. Maxwell's hands tensed a little, one folded over the other on his desk. The Zalian queen shook with fury. The truth is bitter to the betrayer. He recalled the old expression. You did this, she hissed. Did what? Maxwell asked, barely able to restrain his smile. Turned our neighbors against us, the queen hissed again. I only told the truth. If it is bitter to you, what can I do about it? Indeed, a better question might be, what can you do about it? The Grand Presider let the question hang. The Zalian Queen sensed the double meaning, proving herself not a total fool. What do you want, war ape? The Queen pressed. You have some things of ours, things you took when we placed faith in you. Return them, and it may be that we and your neighbors have less reason to mistrust your ships. It may be that as long as you agree for your long voyage ships to travel under escort on predetermined routes, that trade will be reopened, and it may be if you agree to confine your war vessels to patrols inside your space, and for your long voyage ships to travel unarmed, that the rest of the galaxy can begin to trust you again. The Grand Presider's terms bit hard, but Zalians did not form alliances, only brief bargains for specific purposes, and his proposal flew in the face of standard practice. The universe is a large place, Queen of the Zalia, there can be room for all of us when we are willing to coexist. You try to provoke us to fight you, war ape, she accused him. The visual drone shook in time to her rage. No, I prefer to win without fighting, Presider Maxwell said plainly. War is a stupid, destructive waste. There's no glory there, whatever the stories say. Just the guilty, the dead, and the ones who wish it never happened. This isn't a provocation, this is a warning. You wonder why we've built this coalition. Why us, war apes, were so adept at talking and negotiating until we have you encircled? It's because there are only two options. Peace or war? She finished the thought, listening with sudden attention to the war ape. Yes, peace or war. Humans became very good at diplomacy, making it one of our most potent arts and potent weapons because we terrified ourselves, apex predators in a world that casually obliterates anything living on it. We learned to fight with peace because if we did not, we would destroy ourselves. Now we face the larger universe, including you. War becomes more destructive. War becomes worse. Diplomacy becomes more valuable and more potent. We used our first weapon against the Pankin. Now we've used our second against you. Come to terms or attack. The presider replied to her and spread his hands apart on his desk, offering her two choices. I am making a choice for peace and the entire occupied galaxy knows it, you can do the same. Give back what was stolen, and make peaceful overtures as I've described, or attack. Maybe you take my space station. Maybe you remove our biomatter. Maybe you kill our biomatter. But think how that would look. Everybody knows you don't value the lives of any but your own. You'll then show that you will not even respect even terms of peace. Nobody is safe with you as a neighbor. The presider went quiet. So did the Zalian queen. We give you the systems. You stop what you have done, she asked, less angry and more intrigued. One better. I will act as a broker with you, to help you come to terms with your neighbors for your own mutual security. The universe is a dangerous place. Who knows what terrors lie beyond the distant void? The massives make trouble in the galactic east and the first signals of our own explorer vessels report finding degraded artificial radio waves, meaning there are undiscovered civilizations that may be far more advanced by the time we reach them. In short, he gave the Zalian queen a very polite smile. I destroy you as our enemies when I make you into friends. The Grand Presider watched the way the Zalian queen froze. He reflected on her response. She'd likely heard the concept before and learned of its utility. Too, she saw the tripled strength of the Terran borders when the Goslians and Gonic ships were added to the human strength. In the way or at your side, you say this among your people. Is it not? she asked. The translation was muddled at best, but he recognized her intent. Something like that. In our ancient mythologies, 
People believed in powerful monsters, the worst of which was the devil. And it was sometimes said that it was better to be at the devil's right hand than in its path. So, make your choice, Zalian Queen. You are devils, she said, and killed the transmission. Three months later, the Keelan Confederation listened with open-mouthed disbelief. I of the Zalian people express regret for the misunderstanding over the previous events regarding the occupied worlds, and will withdraw our swarm from each of the systems our misunderstanding led us to occupy. Let it be known that the Zalia desire peace to reign between our races, and we formally express our regret that this misunderstanding led to the deaths of the few Pankin left on the surfaces of those worlds. The negotiations that followed were swift, headed by the human presider. Predetermined routes were laid out over which Zalians could travel, and worlds or moons considered useless to other races. Resource poor or too expensive to convert to habitable zones were permitted for Zalians, always under strict conditions of non-industrialization for those worlds, allowing the Zalia to reduce their overpopulation without posing threats to their neighbors. The provocation led to the first formal long-term treaty of common defense for the entire Galactic West to sign. An agreement of common defense, fixed military patrols, cooperative actions, trade exchanges, and migration. By the gods of our abandoned past, they did it, High Lord Avon said to his Ganekian counterpart. They really did it. I never thought the Zalia would concede anything to anyone. They are a frightening race, and the queen was no fool. She knew she couldn't take on everyone. She was faced with a devil she didn't understand and learned from it, the Keelan leader replied. He let out the huffing version of his race's laugh. I thought for sure the humans would provoke a war. I did not know it was possible to provoke a peace, a scary, scary race. Very much so, and it worked out well for us this time, High Lord Avon replied, enjoying a polite conversation for a while and more trivial matters before the conversation ended. For twelve years there was unprecedented levels of peace, until Grand Presider Maxwell's term of service ended, and the human presider became the first non ganakian to become the speaker for the entire confederation. The first true challenge to his administration came not long after, when the Massives made their demands on the Goslian border and mustered a fleet of thousands and sparked a crisis throughout the quadrant.